Uh, okay, I think we're live now. So, um, hello everybody. I am Judge Stephen Menashe of the Second Circuit, and I will be the moderator for this panel today. Welcome to our one o'clock uh, panel. The name of the panel is, Is Faithful Execution Being Devoured by Factional Execution? And the panel will consider uh, reversals of position from one administration uh, to the next, and whether such reversals are consistent with respect for the rule of law and the expectations of parties who are subject to changed rules. Of course, whether a change in position um, is consistent with uh, respect for the law or is unduly disruptive might depend on how abrupt uh, and complete the change in position is. And it might also depend on how the administration changes position, because of course, uh, there are many ways to effectuate change in positions, such as executive orders, a change in a litigation position, uh, interpretive guidance, engaging in a rulemaking or sponsoring legislation. And it might be that the mode or even how you uh, employ that mode uh, makes a difference as to whether it's consistent with rule of law values. So to help us puzzle through these uh, questions, we have four distinguished panelists with us today. But before I introduce them, I'm going to note a few housekeeping things. So one is if you are in the audience, you can send text-based questions through the Q&A tab in the upper right corner of your screen. And after all of the panelists make their opening uh, remarks, I'll look to those questions to facilitate a discussion among the panelists. And then we will open up the discussion for uh, the audience to ask questions directly um, from the floor or the virtual floor. And you can do that by pressing the raised raise hand button, um, and I will see raised hands in my, uh, my interface, and we'll call on you then. There's also a chat tab for attendees to chat with each other, but that is only for attendees to discuss amongst each other, so don't use that function to ask questions because uh, we, won't, we won't see it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order in which they will be uh, speaking. So first up, we're going to hear from Professor Eloise Pasikoff. Uh, who is a professor of law and the Anne Fleming Research Professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where she specializes in the administrative law of federal funding. Uh, she's a public member of the Administrative Conference, Conference of the United States and formerly was a clerk to Justice uh, Sotomayor. Next, we'll hear from Hashem Mupan, who was recently the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Appellate Staff of the Civil Division at the U.S. Department of Justice and also served as Counselor uh, to the Solicitor General. Uh, before that government service, uh, he was a partner in Jones Day's Issues and Appeals Practice, and he's argued several cases in the Supreme Court and in the Courts of Appeals, uh, and is a former clerk for Justice Scalia. Next, we'll hear from uh, Virginia Seitz. Ms. Seitz is a partner in Sidley Austin's Supreme Court and Appellate Practice, uh, where she represents a wide range of clients in the U.S. Supreme Court and Courts of Appeals. Uh, before that, she served as Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice uh, and is a former clerk for Justice Brennan. And finally, we'll hear from Farnaz Thompson. Ms. Thompson is a partner at McGuire Woods, where she represents employers and institutions of higher education before federal and state courts, as well as before uh, federal agencies. Before joining McGuire Woods, she served as the Deputy General Counsel for Post-Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education, and also as an in-house counsel at the University of Virginia. And she is a former clerk to Chief Justice Hassell of the Supreme Court of uh, Virginia. And so with those introductions, let's turn to Professor Pasikoff. Well, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So it's my job as the first panelist to set the stage a bit, and I'm gonna do so by pushing back at the premise of the panel description, which I would describe as um, gentle alarmism about presidential transitions. So I take the underlying thrust of the description to suggest that abrupt and complete reversals in position as administrations change destabilize the rule of law and undermine the premise of consent by the governs. So I'm gonna make four quick points in response. My first point is that most of government continues to chug along. 
as administrations change. There are not huge upheavals in everything. So the same conditions on the core education grants to K-12 schools, kids in special education apply, social security checks continue to go out, disability claims continue to be heard, the FDA continues to approve drugs, et cetera. So in most ways, I just wanna underscore that the day-to-day -day experience of most individual people and regulated industry will not feel vast changes. So I wanna start by just pushing back at the premise that abrupt and complete reversals throughout government characterize most transition periods. So my second point is, of course, there are hugely major changes as well, but I don't think that's undermining respect for the rule of law. I wanna suggest that that's embracing the separation of powers supported by regular elections, where different administrations will implement different policy choices that they articulated during the campaign and that they'll do so within the bounds of delegated statutory authority. And where their actions exceed the scope of this authority, courts can stop them. So that's consistent with the rule of law. Um, these major changes are in fact why we have elections. And so implementation of these changes directly reflects the consent of the governed, assuming of course, free and fair elections. When the Department of Justice changes its litigation position in court as an administration changes, it's often because the underlying issue was an executive action that the new administration no longer wants to defend because it wants to make a different underlying policy choice. So if you think about the typical challenge to an administrative action, it might be challenged on procedural grounds as not complying with the requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act, on statutory grounds as not within the limits of what the statute authorizes, or on arbitrary and capricious grounds where the decision-making process and expressed rationale don't comply with reasoned decision-making. So all of those arguments are beside the point as a matter of what to defend in court if the new administration is going to withdraw the underlying administrative action of the previous administration. A related observation about deference here and the lack of any conflict with the duty of the courts to say what the law is in this context. Many of those arguments that I just articulated on, are not matters on which any deference is provided. So agencies don't get any deference on whether they complied with the APA or, are, or whether they acted arbitrarily or capriciously, or even whether their statute is ambiguous. And where Chevron issues are embedded, the delegation and accountability rationales that underlie Chevron are precisely the point. The court still retains the authority to say what the law is, within the bounds of which agencies can legally act. So again, that is completely consistent with the rule of law function. My third point is that there are absolutely times in which dramatic flip-flops and uh, dramatic overhauls can be troubling from a rule of law perspective. So one example might be uh, using the criminal law, for example, to target presidential enemies or to benefit presidential friends. That would be deeply problematic from a rule of law perspective. It can also be troublesome when an executive order demands immediate and dramatic changes in legal consequences for private parties, rather than requesting that agencies take certain actions within a particular time frame, because the latter provides more notice and less disruption to private parties. Um, but these are not the mine run of cases, and I don't wanna overplay the dramatic for the kind of ordinary way things operate. My fourth and final point is that I think we actually ought to tone down the rhetoric about transitions as reflecting vast upheaval and disruption and undermining the rule of law. I worry that that kind of rhetoric itself contributes to a public lack of understanding about the machinery of government and that over time can erust, er, excuse me, over time can erode trust in government and the genius of our American experiment. So I will stop there and we'll turn things over to Hash Mupen. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Pasikoff. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so picking up from there, I, I agree with a lot of what Professor Pasikoff said. I think context matters a lot in this, uh, in terms of when you set sometimes uh, after a change administration, it's going to be appropriate or even necessary to change positions, and sometimes it won't. And whether it's appropriate or not turns on a lot of different factors. So I think what I'll do this morning in my opening remarks is lay out some of the factors that I think are relevant, and then 
assess how the uh, new administration and the last administration compare on some of those factors. Uh, so the first major factor I think that's relevant is what the nature of the change. Is it an agency changing its actual policy on the ground or is it the government just changing its litigating position in court? When the agency is changing its actual policies on the ground, I agree with Professor Pasikoff that you know elections have consequences and agencies are going to make changes to policy. Uh, and in that context, I think what's most important is that the agencies comply with the APA. The APA, of course, requires reasoned decision making, including considering reliance interests that have built up around old policies. But and all of that's fairly well known. I think one lesser appreciated fact is ensuring that litigation over the old rules is resolved in a way that ensures that the APA is complied with in changing to the new rule. In particular, ensuring that judgments against the old rule are not left in place in a way that sort of obviates the need to go through notice and comment rulemaking to get rid of the old rule. Uh, turning to just sheer litigation uh, changes, in that context, I think the rule of law interests are a little bit more implicated because you're not talking about policy changes. You're just talking about what the executive branch is telling courts the law is. And in that context, I think it's, if anything, it's more than anything, it's about the credibility of the Department of Justice and its respect for both the courts and the litigants. That said, even in that context, of course, there are going to be times where it's appropriate to change. A couple of factors that I think are relevant in assessing that are things like how recently was the prior position taken? What level of court was the prior position taken? Uh, when is the change in position happening in the course of the litigation? And what's the nature of the issue? All of those sort of factors go into whether the courts and the parties will perceive the, the Department of Justice changing position as reflecting respect for the litigants and the courts and the adjudicative process. So, you know, let me now turn to sort of assessing both uh, the last administration and the current administration on those sort of factors. Uh, in the Trump administration, it was fairly well publicized at the time that in the first term or the first six months or so, uh, the Trump administration changed positions in the Supreme Court in four major cases. There was the Epic case that involved the FAA and the NLRB. There was the Janus case that involved agency union fees. There was the Husted case, which involved uh, voter registration. And there was the Lucia case, which involved uh, SEC ALJs. And I think there are two significant factors about those cases. None of them were cases in which uh, the Solicitor General's office flipped a position that had already been taken in a Supreme Court merits brief in that case. Only one of them even flipped a search stage filing in the same case. And ultimately, of course, uh, the changed position was the position that the Supreme Court adopted in all four cases. Uh, and I'm not aware of any cases in the Trump administration's first term where you, what you had was you had an existing agency policy that was already in the Supreme Court, and then the underlying agency action was changed. So that second category of cases just wasn't implicated in the Trump administration. If you turn to what's been going on this first few months in the Obama administration, uh, it's similar, but I think there's some notable differences. So there have been, I believe, five, at least five changes of litigation position. Three of those flipped a, the position that the uh, prior administration had taken in a merits brief in the Supreme Court already. So there's the most pu well publicized of those was the ACA case. Uh, but they, also in Cedar Point, which was a takings case, and Brinovich, which is a Voting Rights Act case, uh, the new administration changed. They fi basically filed letters with the Supreme Court saying they didn't hold to either a part or all of prior briefs in just short letters. Um, and then in two other cases, AFP and Terry, the government changed its position after the cert stage. After they'd already taken a position in the cert stage, they flipped in the merits case. The Terry case in particular was fairly remarkable. It's a criminal case where the, the government had opposed the criminal defendant at the cert stage. The government didn't file, on, didn't notify the court or anyone else of their change in position until the day their merits resp response brief was due. And then they filed a letter saying that they'd flip positions. And so then the court had to scramble and appoint an amicus to defend the judgment below. 
And at the argument, there were some questions from several justices about the court, uh, the government's change in position. Uh, obviously, in all five of these cases, uh, the court hasn't ruled yet, so we can't assess uh, what the court thinks of the new positions. But from argument, I, I'll just say I'd be pretty surprised if uh, they go five for five in the changes of position. But probably the most remarkable aspect of what the new administration has done is actually in the context of changes to policies that were already in the court. Uh, some of these were handled in the sort of ordinary way that I think Professor Paskoff was referring to. You know, the agency changed its underlying policy, and because of that, the court basically, at the government's urging, put the cases in abeyance, and those cases will go away. And that happens in every administration, uh, and it's not uncommon. But there were two cases where something different happened. In the Title X rule and the public charge rule, in both of those cases, the new administration hasn't changed its policy through notes and common rulemaking yet. And there were all the cases were already in the Supreme Court granted. And the government basically in the public charge cases dismissed all their cert petitions, dismissed all their appeals, and they did the same thing in the Title X case. And what that had the effect of doing is locking in a district court judgment or a court of appeals judgment that was adverse to the rule without having to go through notice and comment rulemaking to get rid of the rule, at least as to the parties to the judgment. That's particularly notable in the public charge case, because in the public charge case, one of the judgments was a nationwide vacator from a district court, and the Supreme Court had already granted a stay. So the Supreme Court had already determined that the public charge rule was likely going to be upheld as valid. But the new administration came in and just dismissed all their appeals, which had the effect of letting the single district court judgment wipe out the rule nationwide and obviate the need for APA rulemaking. And that, I believe, is a fairly remarkable change. Uh, that's very unusual to happen for the department for a substantive rule to be wiped out that way. And that, I do think, pretty, uh, presents pretty significant rule of law issues. Judge Van Dyke in the Ninth Circuit actually wrote a, a fairly interesting dissent on that point. Uh, with that, I will uh, transition over to uh, Ms. Seitz. Thanks, Ash. So I think to answer the question whether faithful execution is being devoured by factional execution, you have to first decide whether the take care clause or some other provision of the Constitution contains some kind of general anti-lurching principle that might constrain a new president changing positions about what the law requires. And so although this panel's question involves lurching in the executive branch, you, you could, of course, ask the same question about lurching in the legislative or judicial branches. And I don't think anyone would suggest that the Constitution imposes general limits on Congress changing the law going forward after an election. But Congress's ability to lurch after an election is severely constrained by the challenges our Constitution creates for enacting laws. And the judicial branch has anti-lurching constraints imposed by its passive function and the doctrine of stare decisis, and the role of the Supreme Court and other factors. But, but where do we look for analogous anti-lurching constraints on a newly elected president? There are substantive and procedural laws like the APA, limits on his power in the Constitution, and what some call norms. But it's historically pretty typical for a new executive branch to change positions within a range of reasonable interpretations of the law and the Constitution, including on fundamental constitutional issues. And whenever the Supreme Court and Congress have left room for interpretation on legal questions with salience to public issues of the day, the new executive branch can take advantage of that room and act on its own view. So I think the last six administrations have changed position on the so-called Mexico City policy within weeks of taking office. And you might even say we have elections precisely to bring about some of these changes in position. So what is the basis for arguing that there's a principle of executive branch starry decisive that constrains the newly elected president? So I think some people have the intuition that the law shouldn't depend on the party in power. And that feels right, but to me, it just raises the question of what's embedded in the concept of law. And if you believe, as I do, that although the law isn't indeterminate, that there are sometimes, there are often multiple ways of viewing interpretive issues, then there's room for reasonable principal disagreement about what the law is. And on that view, if you're within the room, the real issue with flip-flopping isn't the flip-flop, but substantive concerns with the new executive position from a policy perspective. And then saying the law shouldn't change with politics is pretty good rhetoric, but it isn't really a legal argument. 
Of course, it's only human nature to want to make a strong argument to limit change when your favored legal framework has been on top, but is threatened, and the law works for that. But if we're in the reasonable interpretation space, I think that change isn't really a violation of law. A second concern is that if you agree there's a range of possible interpretations, once the executive picks one, there's an independent benefit in maintaining that interpretation because of the reliance interests we've been talking about. That's a very powerful policy point. And in some contexts, it argues for putting a very large thumb on the scale against changing positions. Except in certain narrow areas though, reliance interests aren't really fought to impose constitutional constraints on legislative lurching with the occasional exception from the due process clause. And it's really hard to see why it would or should be different in the executive branch. And in areas where reliance interests are low, as with almost all debated constitutional questions about the internal functioning of the executive branch, or when change is reasonably expected, then reliance interests simply don't carry the day. Finally, some might argue that the take care clause, the duty of faithful execution, by itself implies a duty of ex the executive branch not to depart from prior legal positions. This would have to be a theory that the take care clause has some kind of penumbral emanations that impose a sort of substantive stare decisis requirement, which is a view that's pretty hard to square with our nature's history, nation's history or with any precedent about the clause. One could just as easily argue that the take care clause requires the president to be responsive to the penumbral emanations of the people underlying his or her election. And that's not to say, though, that the executive branch doesn't observe important anti-lurching norms. For decades, the Solicitor General's office has used such a norm in changing the United States position in litigation. And my old office, the Office of Legal Counsel, did act as a kind of voice and repository of precedent for stare decisis in the executive branch in many areas. It had a body of precedent it followed. It had extraordinary career lawyers with deep institutional knowledge and it had a tradition of quietly saying no to the executive branch. In my experience, the same was true in general counsel's offices in many federal agencies. There's a perception since 9-11 that it's increasingly difficult for OLC to dampen lurching, lurching, but my sense is that it continues fighting that good fight. I agree though that the norms constraining lurching are becoming fragile, and that may explain in part why people are looking for a legal constraint. And of course, partisanship and polarization make lurching worse. And polarization is quite high right now. And I think that directly leads to lurching because the further you see the other side from the middle, the less likely you are to feel the pull of stability. The further you see the other side from the middle, the less likely you are to see their constituencies, reliance interests as legitimate. The further you see the other side from the middle, the greater its departure from norms the less likely you are to trust it to respect your stability interests when it resumes power. And the more polarized we are, the harder it is for lawmaking to resolve these outstanding issues when lurching occurs, because there is no basis for compromise. And that is how both sides feel about the other right now. And I don't see the take care clause as a basis for solving this quite fundamental problem. I'll turn it over to Ms. Thompson now. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I think the theme that we can all agree on is elections have consequences. And really, federal officials are elected to change policies at some level. How they go about changing those policies can help either strengthen or undercut the rule of law. And I think I have a unique appreciation for the rule of law because I'm an immigrant from Iran and I was born in Tehran. So I think it's really important how policies change. So with respect to changes in regulations, three factors that I would look to to determine whether the change actually strengthens or undercuts the rule of law. And those factors include, first, is the change in policy consistent with current case law or is the change really an opportunity to circumvent case law? The second factor I'd look at is does the change actually have the force and effect of law? Is the change in policy actually legally enforceable? And the third factor I'd look to is, what is the reason justification for the change? I might not agree with the policy, but if there's a reason justification, then I think reasonable minds may disagree and that the rule of law continues to be upheld. 
I had the privilege of working at the University of Virginia, and I worked on their Title IX policies under President Obama's administration. And I'm very familiar with President Obama's policies in the 2011 Dear Colleague letter. And I also had the opportunity to work on the Title IX final rule as part of the last administration. And so I really wanted to use Title IX as a concrete example and go through these factors. And I'll actually state that the Title IX final rule, which was published May of 2020, I'll say that was considered a sea change. And it's still one of those things that may go back and forth. But in terms of whether the final regulations under Title IX that were promulgated in 2020 are consistent with case law, I would assert that they are because the foundation for those regulations was the Supreme Court case, Davis versus Monroe. That was a seminal case with respect to sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination under Title IX. And that case really provided the framework for the regulations. One of the more controversial, perhaps, aspects of the regulations is the opportunity for live hearing and a live cross-examination. But again, that too is consistent with current case law, both with respect to the Third Circuit and private universities, as well as the Sixth Circuit and public universities. Both of those federal appellate courts have held that live cross-examination or some form of cross-examination between the parties is a necessary aspect of a hearing under Title IX. With respect to the second factor, is the change in policy legally enforceable? The 2020 Title IX final rule went through notice and comment rulemaking. It's a legislative rule. Prior to those regulations, the last time the department significantly regulated on Title IX was 1975. So in between 1975 and 2020, at least with respect to sexual harassment, what was guiding institutions of higher education as well as other schools with respect to Title IX was really just a series of guidance documents which don't have the force and effect of law. At best, the guidance documents referred to as dear colleague letters were interpretive rules, which at most would be afforded our deference, but certainly they were not legislative rules. And the last, kind of factor that I would consider is what's the reason justification? As Hosh mentioned, the Administrative Procedure Act requires there to be a reason justification for a policy change. And the reason justification for the Title IX final regulations were essentially to provide people who come forward with reports of sexual harassment with the support that they need while also providing due process for both parties. Before the Title IX final regulations, there was no legally enforceable obligation to provide support to people who come forward with reports of sexual harassment. And this rule actually requires that as soon as someone comes forward with such a report that they, that the institution, the school, offers them supportive measures. And if the school has actual knowledge without someone coming forward, they also have to offer those supportive measures. And those supportive measures are offered irrespective of whether the individual who allegedly experienced the sexual harassment, actually files a formal complaint or wants to go through a hearing. And also with respect to due process, I think that people forget that due process benefits both parties. So if someone who comes forward with allegations of sexual harassment has those allegations dismissed, they deserve, they deserve to know why. They also deserve to have the opportunity to challenge the justification or the reason for the dismissal just as much as an accused deserves to know what the allegations against them are and have a meaningful opportunity to respond to those allegations. And just this week, the Department of Education opened up registration for public comments, either live or written, on the Title IX final rule. And that is in pursuant to an executive order that President Biden issued asking the Secretary of Education to either review, rescind, or suspend the Title IX final rule. I personally don't think that there are any legal reasons to suspend it or justifications to suspend it, but certainly the department can go through notice and comment rulemaking to revise it or to rescind aspects of it. It has survived challenges in litigation and there are still three cases pending, so we'll see what happens. But I'm encouraged that this administration is taking public comment and announced just on April 6th that they intend to issue notice a notice of proposed rulemaking, which leads me to believe that the process will be a fair one. It remains to be seen whether the changes are consistent with case law and what the reason justifications for any changes are, but I'm encouraged that 
irrespective of our differences with respect to policy, there's a process that this government continues to follow with respect to issuing regulations. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Judge Menashe. Thanks very much uh, for those opening uh, remarks, uh, everybody. So I'd like to have some discussion among the panelists and maybe get some inter some responses to the other comments. And maybe I could start um, by asking Eloise to respond to something that Hosh said, which is you had said in your opening remarks that when um, an administration changes position or no longer wants to defend something in litigation, it's because they want to change the underlying rule. But Hosh had drawn a distinction. You know, obviously there's a there's a difference between saying your new rule is better and saying your new rule is legally compelled or that the prior administration's rule was illegal. And so Hosh drew a distinction between cases where you might change the underlying rule and maybe delay the litigation to change it and ones where you accept an adverse judgment that the prior rule was illegal. And so is the way you know, that is, does that distinction make a difference for, I just, maybe you could react to that. Yeah, it actually does. And I made a note, it, this is you saying that, because I think that's a really important clarifying point, Hush, and I, and I valued the fact that you brought it up. Um, if I could also go back to one other thing that Hush, you said that I also found very interesting was the, the time, the, the posture, I guess, of the positions in the, in the actions in the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And one of the, the challenges of where the Biden um, actions fall, the fact that the rules are in court has to do with the prior administrations pushing them into the Supreme Court and the timing of all that. So some of that is just, I think, coincidental. I'm a little reluctant to read too much into the posture of where the cases are in between the, the you know, as between the two administrations, because I think some of that is outside the administration's control. Um, but I'm a fan of notice and comment. So I am going to, and, and I think, and I'm a, you know, I, I'm an administrative law professor. I teach the Administrative Procedure Act. I, I, I love the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, and so I, um, I'm gonna also kind of support what, what Farnaz, you were saying about the, the going through notice and comment in order to do that. So I'm gonna agree that Hush, that's a, the, the moment that you talked about. I think it's, it is less, um, sort of destabilizing from a rule of law perspective to go through the proper procedure rather than just to accept an adverse judgment. I'm not totally clear that the current administration isn't planning on doing that with the public charge rule. So I don't wanna kind of speak too much about the posture of that, but uh, but I like very much the granularity of the distinction, um, even though I'm pushing back a little bit on the happenstance of the differences between the two administrations writ large and where the where the procedures are. Okay, well, maybe I could ask uh, Hosh to respond to that. So I guess there are two two things there. So one is, um, if the posture of the case depends on the actions of the prior administration, why should that constrain the subsequent administration that's elected? So maybe you could ex respond to that and say why that uh, makes a difference. And then on this question about whether the administration plans to change the rule, does that obviate the concern about accepting the adverse judgment? Uh, sure. So I'll take those in reverse order because uh, it's a little bit easier. So as uh, my understanding of the public charge rule is uh, immediately upon dismissing all the appeals, uh, the new administration published something in the, uh, in the Federal Register saying the public charge rule is gone because the district court judgment vacated it and all the appeals were dismissed. So they are not enforcing the public charge rule, even though they haven't gone through notice and comment. I don't know whether they intend to later go through notice and comment, because the pre-Trump version was all based on the 1999 guidance document. So maybe they intend to go through notice and comment rulemaking for whatever version of the public charge rule they want to have. But in the interim, right now on the ground, they have reverted to the 99 guidance rather than the 20 whatever year rule without having gone through notice and comment to uh, effectuate that basing based solely on the district court judgment that the Supreme Court had already stayed. So uh, I do think that is pretty uh, concerning. As for the broader question, look, I, I, I don't think I don't think it's right to say anyone's hands are ever tied. Of course, in any circumstance, whatever, wherever you are in the procedural posture, the, the executive branch always has discretion to make decisions, but I think you have to take the hand you're dealt with, right? So if cases are in the Supreme Court and you know the case has already been argued, I think 
the justices and the public and the regulated community are going to be in a different position if you try to yank the uh, rug out from under that suit than a case that's you know in district court and people are deciding whether to take an appeal. Now, does that mean that by rushing up to the Supreme Court, you may be boxing the subsequent administration? Perhaps, but it also just reflects that each administration has to consider the facts and circumstances before that. Uh, so, I, you know, it is true that uh, I don't think we went in either public charge or title uh, title ten. You know, they there were square circuit splits in both cases. Uh, so, it's I don't think it was necessarily all that rushed. Uh, but even if it was, it seems to me like when you're making decisions in the Department of Justice, you have to account for where you are at the time you are. Okay, let me um, ask. Yeah, go ahead. So I think Virginia wants to weigh in. So why don't you just do that? And I think I also have a question, but I'll hold it. I had a, Judge, I just had a different angle based on listening to that conversation, which was I wonder how much people think this kind of problem is caused or created by the difficulty of a transition in modern times, you know, getting your people in. It, it feels a little bit more like the the rush to get things done uh, because of the limited amount of time you have to effectuate your policies is affecting how the lack of orderliness in the process for change. And I wondered if, uh, Hosh, you thought that there was some effect of that on the you know, the way in which the Biden transition happened. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about it. it. It's hard for me to see why, why that would be the case. I, I, it's not like the inability to go through, you know, to pro promulgate a notes and comment rule. It, it, it's not like they're hamstrung by the fact that they don't have enough political appointees in DHS or HHS to start down the rulemaking process. In fact, I believe they've already started down the NPRM process for the Title X rule. So I, I don't think it's right that it is out of some view that they are hamstrung in the ability to go the APA route. I think, frankly, it's out of a combination of not wanting to have the rule in effect right away, not wanting to have to defend it in the court, and not wanting the Supreme Court to uphold the old rule which they were likely to do in the public charge case because they'd already granted the stay. Because having the Supreme Court say that the old rule was lawful and reject a bunch of the policy arguments that have been made against it is going to, to some extent, affect what the new administration would say in notice and comment rulemaking for a new rule. So it seems to me that's largely what's driving this, not sort of the staffing problems at the front of an administration. Well, beyond the staffing problems, I think the question was also about the amount of time you have in one administration. So if the rulemaking process is lengthy and cumbersome and every new rule is subject to a very lengthy litigation process, does that mean that administrations are really looking for shortcuts to get closer to policy changes than maybe they would have if we had a more efficient or timely system? I think that maybe that's what it was. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, if that is, uh, look, I'm very sympathetic to the concern about the ability to promulgate a rule and actually get a policy in place, uh, given sort of the pace of litigation against it. But it doesn't really seem to me like the solution to that should be these sort of procedural shortcuts, uh, you know, during a transition period. You know, if you've got a rule that's likely valid, acquiescing in the judgment against it does, just doesn't seem to me the appropriate way to deal with the problem that if you go through notes and comment ruling for your own new rule, you're going to be subjected to litigation. Yeah, so uh, Farnaz, I guess as somebody who has done a rulemaking and is familiar with the procedures, maybe you could weigh in on the interaction between the the requirements to follow those procedures and the, the you know, what I guess I'm had been described as shortcuts, but maybe that's an unfair characterization, but uh, the interaction between those two phenomena. Well, I would agree first with Hosh that I think the better course of action is really to file a stay, go through notice and comment rulemaking or whatever you need to do to change the policy position, and then that changes the posture of the litigation, whereas with what Hosh is describing now, you have a federal district court judgment that would preclude another administration or make it at least more difficult for another administration to change the policy in a manner that's against that federal district court judgment. But to your point, Judge Menashe, it is a very onerous process to go through notice and comment rulemaking. And 
I often wondered why President Obama's administration didn't do that with Title IX until I got to the Department of Education and realized just all the hoops that you have to jump through. So first of all, the Office of Management Budget and OIRA play a key role and you have to kind of make sure that every agency is on board or at least has an opportunity to comment on your proposal. So that's just going through the notice of proposed rulemaking that stage. And then with respect to all the comments you receive, coming through those comments, making sure that you respond to every unique aspect of the comment. And with respect to the Title IX rule, at least, from the notice of proposed rulemaking stage to the actual final rule, there were a lot of changes that were made as a result of comment. But those comments were very, you know, it's very difficult to go through those. And then to actually issue the final rule, you go through that same process with the Office of Management and Budget their internal guidance documents and within the agencies as to the process, but it's very onerous. And so by the time you actually issue the final rule and give institutions and schools an opportunity or the regulated, regulated entities an opportunity to comply with it, it's, you know, you're looking at two to three years and you're almost at the end of the administration. And then you have to go through the litigation, the preliminary, in, the motions for a preliminary injunction and it's a very burdensome process. So I can understand why it'd be easier to issue a dear colleague letter or to issue guidance on something, but with guidance, it's, there's two problems with, well, first of all, it's not a legislative rule, but then also I think that there's a fair notice issue because at least with notice and comment rulemaking, you know that there's a process in place and there's usually at least 30 days or 60 days to comply with the rule. But with respect to guidance, I remember being at a university and having a new dear colleague letter issued without any notice. And then all of a sudden you wonder, OK, well, how when when does this interpretation from the Department of Education take effect? Because it's just really an interpretive rule. So it really puts the regulated parties in a state of uncertainty. And I don't think it's the best course of action. I think with respect to guidance documents, the better course of action is to use those as safe harbors for regulated entities so that they can turn to that guidance document and know that there's some certainty that if they interpret this regulation or if they proceed in this course of conduct, that there's a safe harbor for them, but with the knowledge and the note that that's not the only possible way of proceeding. Okay, so I have a question from the audience, which I'm gonna, a written question, which I'm gonna read and then maybe direct it. So, um, the question is, if an incoming administration is hostile to the legal posture of the previous one, won't they just sandbag the case if they are forced to defend it? How could courts trust the new government is giving the best and fairest representation of the policy? And maybe I'll just ask Hosh for initial reaction. I guess maybe the import of that is maybe it's better if a new administration just doesn't defend policies it doesn't agree with, and maybe it's better to have an amicus defend it. Is that like a more open system, or might that be more reliable? You're on, you're on mute. Let me just say you shouldn't. Thanks for uh, reminding me about that. Uh, so, look, I think it depends. Uh, there are going to be the sorts some issues where it's just clear that there are profound both legal and policy differences between administrations, and it's just not tenable for a variety of reasons for a new administration to try to defend the legal position or the policy position of an old administration. In those circumstances, it seems to me what's important to do is to, to for the new administration to tee up the litigation in a way that it continues with a new defender, right? So whether I, I don't necessarily say an amicus more 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 appropriate in those circumstances would be to have someone who's who's interested intervene and take over the defense of the litigation in that circumstance, whether it's a party who benefits from the rule or you know things like that. Um, and, you know, th that is a possible way of proceeding in some of these cases, uh, you know, rather than just dismissing the appeals without giving anyone any notice that they need to intervene. Because, you know, the government often, when parties try to intervene into litigation, when the government is still defending the rule, the government will often oppose and say, no, no, we're adequate representatives for your interest. You don't have any right to intervene. And that, I, that seems right to me, as long as the government's actually defending. But what seems not tenable is to then turn around and say, when we're going to stop defending, we're just going to dismiss the appeals rather than like put people on notice and give people an opportunity to intervene at that point. Uh, but look, I, I do want to emphasize, I do think that's the minority of cases. 
I think there's a large number of cases where even if the new administration doesn't necessarily agree with the old administration, either because it, of institutional reasons or because it's just not that big a deal, the government can continue to defend that position. You know, most of the briefs all the way through have been written and signed by career lawyers who are still there. Uh, most of the positions just aren't at that level of controversy that, you know, we're all lawyers at the end of the day, right? We've all represented clients where we don't necessarily agree with the position our client has taken. So it's not that hard for a new administration to continue to defend some things saying, you know, look, I might not have interpreted the wire fraud statute that way, but, you know, we, they brought this prosecution and we're just going to keep defending it. And, you know, you can think of lots of situations like that and it happens. And in most of those cases, I don't think there's any reason to doubt the bona fides of the government. Uh, and I don't think the courts would unless the brief seems weird. If the brief seems to be not making arguments they should be making, then their credibility is going to take a hit. I don't think, and I never, no one I knew at DOJ would do that. It, it was always either we're going to actually defend this thing or we're, we're not going to defend it. But like trying to sandbag with briefs is just a very bad idea because courts will know that you're not living up to the normal uh, strength of DOJ briefs and they're going to know why. And that's going to hurt the department in the long term. Maybe I could ask um, Virginia to react to that. So I think what's behind what Hosh was just saying is the idea that there was some recognition that there were interests of the government that transcended administrations. And so if you're a lawyer for the government, you might defend those interests, even if you have different policy perspectives. But I think your comments were suggesting that because of polarization and maybe other factors, that sense that there are interests of the government that transcend administrations is weakening or we have less of less of it. Is that is that right? It's fair, although I, I, I want to immediately say how strongly I agree with what Hosh said about um, Department of Justice lawyers and their interests and their integrity and their uh, pursuit of a position in litigation that they're assigned to defend without uh, compromise. I, I mean, my experience was that once the decision had been made to move forward, that the case was um, you know, litigated with uh, complete good faith. And I, I never saw uh, anything that suggested otherwise to me. I was thinking more in terms of, um, you know, the norm, the institutional norm of the SG's thumb on the scale against changing your position in litigation and thumb on the scale of observing OLC precedent. And I think uh, the, the, the desire to do that or the um, strong institutional commitment to do that uh, can feel more fragile, can feel endangered. Uh, if you aren't uh, trusting the bona fides of the people who came before you and the people who will come after you to do the same thing. It was more a fear that that could happen uh, that I was expressing than a view that it has happened. Uh, I don't actually believe that the uh, trans the changes, the lurching that happens with new administrations uh, does undermine the rule of law because I believe that if it's as long as it's within the area of reasonable interpretation, and it's done through a process that's lawful, that it's in fact uh, compliant with the rule of law uh, rather than otherwise. And that calling it a threat to the rule of law because things change the way they do is again, uh, you know, I'd agree with uh, Professor Pachikoff that, you know, that's just uh, inflaming a conversation that could perhaps be held uh, differently about, you know, when is reliance stronger and other kinds of policy interests that might push back against lurching um, along with those institutional norms, but that it's not undermining the rule of law. Okay, I want to remind everybody in the audience that if you raise your hand through the raised hands function in the online interface, I could call on you and have uh, questions from the audience. And I'm going to do that in a moment, but before I do, let me just ask if there's anyone on the panel who wants to react to anything that anybody else has recently said, if there are further comments. Okay, if not, um, I have a raised hand from Dean Reuter from the Federal Society. Hi, um, this is a great discussion. Thank you all for, for participating. Uh, this question might be more on the litigation side than the regulation side, and it's there's two questions, one for each of the four panelists, I suppose, depending. Uh, but for those of you who are skeptical of the wisdom of an, of an executive branch reversal um, of a litigation or regulatory position, or even the power to reverse, could President Trump reverse his own uh, 
positions or policies? And could uh, President Obama reverse his own or President Biden reverse their own? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, and for those of you who endorse a president's authority to reverse, wouldn't a reversal of uh, by President Obama of an Obama stance or by President Trump of a, a Trump administration stance, wouldn't that be perceived as disruptive or somehow coherent, if not undermining the rule of law? Uh, I'll start. I'll start. So just to be clear, uh, I, I guess I was, I'm on the more skeptical side here about some of the changes that have been happening. I don't at all think I agree pretty much entirely with uh, Virginia Sites that this isn't a question of authority. That there, there there's no real enforceable constitutional norm here that we're talking about. That said, I do think faithful execution. You know, part of that duty is a duty to exercise the executive power and the executive power to litigate in a prudent way. And I think considering these things, it's not constitutional, it's not judicially enforceable, but I think it's more than just, you know, any old policy decision. Uh, now, in response to the concrete question, so given that, yeah, I of course think that uh, you can change, the, the, the administration within the same administration can change uh, as to whether they have more le power to do it or less. Look, I suppose that insofar as the concern with changing is a credibility concern with the courts, a concern that you're not actually reflecting your view of the law, you're reflecting a view of just politics. So often that will be a mitigated concern because it's the same political administration. On the other hand, I can imagine it cutting the other way that if it's all still within the same administration, like, what were you doing? Like, presumably you should have known what you did when you took the position earlier. And so it could potentially greater undermine the credibility of the department that you have it within the same administration. It seems like you're the gang that can't shoot straight. So I, I think a lot, like like everything I said about this, I think a lot of it depends on context and how, how the change is justified and how the change will be perceived by the courts. I'll echo and agree with the idea that the that the context just completely matters. I think one context in which you could absolutely justify and find kind of authority, uh, moral authority, I mean, not legal authority, moral authority for a change is when you learn more. I mean, one of the reasons why we have administrative government is for expertise. And so if one, you know, you come in and you're one and you think something's gonna work a certain way and you make a certain choice, and then over the course of time, you realize that it's not working that way. The science improves, you learn more about the science, you learn more about the implementation of the thing in real life. You learn that car companies can't actually do the thing. You know, you learn that it might take 25 years. So I don't know, but, but relying on learning and then reflecting that learning into law um, or into policy positions, I guess I wanna call them, um, strikes me as something that could easily be defended on arbitrary and capricious grounds if assuming that it's framed properly. Um, and and probably I think you know also in Chevron step two if it's within the bounds of permissibility and you could there's a reasoned rationale for why you want to get there, I think you could both um, you, you know do it as a matter of law and then tell a good compelling story that would um, not make you look just like a flip flopper uh, in the public eye. Does anyone else have reaction to that question, or should we move on? All right, so I, there's another um, written comment that says, uh, it's not only an administration's rules that, that one administration might defend and the next one not. Uh, for example, the switchback from Bush 43 to the Obama administration about defending uh, the Defense of Marriage Act. So what about those kinds of changes in legal position where you're just not defending legislation if someone has a reaction to that question? I'll just start by saying that that kind of change or that kind of movement is the subject of a very rigorous and thoughtful procedure in the department before you know a decision is made not to defend the constitutionality of a law. Um, and you know that that norm of that close examination that involves you know people at the highest level of the department, I think is an important norm and you know represents the best of what Hosh was talking about. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would add that, as is fairly well known and also publicized in various uh, letters to Congress, et cetera, in general, the uh, the Department of Congress, uh, the Department of Justice will defend acts of Congress if there's any reasonable argument to be made. There are some exceptions to that, the most notable one being if the law implicates the executive's Article II prerogatives. But in general, uh, it's 
it's not really a question of which side do we think is right. It's is there a reasonable argument that can be made here? Uh, then we uh, the department will generally defend an act of Congress. That being the case, it becomes commensurately less likely that a mere switch in administration is going to lead to a flip on the defense of an act of Congress because the the window to say it, it's pretty narrow to be able to have to come in and say, you know what, they defended it on X ground, but that ground is not only wrong, it's so wrong that it's not reasonable that you can defend it. But it becomes commensurately harder. Um, maybe I could turn back to something that you said earlier, Hash, about the government often says that people can't intervene to defend a law because the government says it's defending the interests sufficiently. I think the suggestion was that when the government is not willing to defend it or is um, not as enthusiastic about it, maybe, uh, I mean, is the suggestion that courts should be more permissive about intervention under those circumstances? Is that something that they should take into consideration when deciding whether to allow artists to intervene? Well, so this is the tricky thing about it, right? Because I think that it's, pro at least in terms of intervention as of right, I think it, the government is pretty much right that when they say that, when they're actually continuing to defend the rule, they are an adequate representative for the public. And you should, probably shouldn't be able to come in and say that you can intervene as of right. But I think that only holds together if the department handles litigation in situations where they change positions in a way that allows those people to come in at the, on the back end. If they instead do what they've done in you know cases like the Title X case, where they just pop in and dismiss everything without giving anyone a chance to intervene, I think it's going to put pressure on courts on the front end, because people are going to start filing intervention motions saying, well, we're worried they may change positions. And look what they did last time. They like came in at the dead of night and dismissed stuff. And I think there are going to be a lot of courts that are going to take that more seriously. And so I think it's important that if the department is going to change positions in these sort of litigation contexts, that they do it in a way that facilitates the ability of, of aggrieved parties to continue to defend the rule. Otherwise, I think they are going to run a risk that courts are going to start allowing more intervention on the front end. And I, you know, as a former government litigator, I don't think that's actually a good result because it just leads to more parties at a time when you don't need to have more parties, as opposed to ensuring that when you do need to have parties, they can get in. Well, maybe I could ask um, Eloise to react to that, or it looks like you actually want to react to yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I was actually going to kind of tie a couple things together and throw a question back out to my colleagues. To what extent do people think that a, a, a court decision that the first administration's uh, say regulatory action was not arbitrary and capricious, ties the hands of the subsequent uh, administration. So we've had a couple of suggestions that um, the, you, you know, that a, that a decision blessing, uh, you know, a Trump rule, for example, in the Supreme Court would make it much harder. I, I say, uh, say, say blessing it, but I want to be precise here, blessing it as not arbitrary or capricious. So allowing it within the scope of what is permissible within arbitrary and capricious land. To what extent would, um, do, do you think that that would significantly tie the hands for the Biden administration say to take a strongly different opposition? Because again, the scope of arbitrary and capricious is quite high. So I feel like there's a little bit of an underlying premise that that a positive decision here would, would play a really strongly limiting decision here. And I'm just wondering, if my intuition that that's what people are suggesting is right, and if so, if we could maybe talk a little bit about what, what drives that sense. Yeah, so, so look, I think there are two aspects of it. One aspect is it's not the reasoning, it's the judgment, right? So if the first court strikes down the rule, the Trump rule as arbitrary and capricious, and there's no appeal, then no one has to do anything, right? So it, it's not that it ties the Biden administration's hand, it's that it frees the Biden administration's hand, right? And then, but setting that aside, so let's say, then the question is not that we don't want to avoid the loss, it's we want to get the win in the appellate court. There, I agree with you that if the ruling is merely that it wasn't arbitrary and capricious, then that will tend to, it will have some effect, right? Because it will take off the table certain types of policy arguments that they could have otherwise used to justify the new rule. But it doesn't take off the table too much, given the breadth of arbitrary and capricious reasoning. This tends to have more of a bite on questions of statutory authority than on arbitrary and capricious. I think that's probably true. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would also agree with that. It's almost like the 
Fox versus FCC case, right? So the FCC can take a radically different position, right, on whether expletives are allowed or not allowed. And it's and I don't think that just because a court holds that a particular regulation is not arbitrary and capricious prevents another administration from coming out with another policy position, but I think it makes it at least more compelling for that administration to really hone down on what the reason justification is. Because I remember with several regulations, the borrower defense and repayment regulations that I worked on, the Title IX regulations, because some aspects of the dear colleague letters actually were referred to by courts, we really made a point of going through every kind of aspect of those dear colleague letters, even though they weren't regulations and providing a reason justification for the change. Maybe we didn't have to, but I think it's a best practice to. And I think that with respect to other regulations, that's also what's necessary. But I don't think it precludes another administration from taking a totally different policy position. But I think it would preclude an administration from trying to, for example, stay a set of regulations or suspend regulations. I know there were some issues there with the borrower defense or payment regulations that President Obama's administration had issued and that the next administration was supposed to implement. So I think that's a distinction. And then when we were discussing litigation, I think there's another thing I'd love to get your thoughts on is you know, 28 U.S.C. 530D allows for an administration or an agency to determine whether some aspect of a statute should no longer be enforced because it's unconstitutional or for, and, and usually there's a review process with the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel before an agency actually comes out and makes that pronouncement that it's not going to enforce a certain aspect of a statute. And I've always, and it's very rarely used, but there's a rigorous process within the Department of Justice. And I love all of your thoughts on whether, how that process has been used in the past and whether it's been abused. Does anyone have thoughts about that? I'll let Virginia go first if she wants, since that, a lot of that runs through OLC, but I'm happy to speak to it also. I, I don't have a, uh any reason or recollection or belief that it's a, an abused process at all. Again, I would think of it as similar to what we previously discussed, which that it tends to be really careful and quite rigorous as opposed to abused. But I, you know, no, nothing specific comes to mind on that, Hosh. So you go ahead. Yeah, I didn't have much uh, to say other than that too. It, 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 it functions very similarly to the process for not defending the constitutionality in court. Probably the biggest difference is how much of it is run through OSG rather than OLC, right? Obviously in court, it's gonna be run through OSG and when it's just the agencies out in the world, OLC probably has the lead, but in both circumstances, I think both of those offices will tend to be pretty heavily involved given the stakes and given as Farnaz uh, referenced, you know, you have to send a letter to Congress under 530D when you make that determination. So. These are things you can just sort of do in the dead of night and hope no one notices. So the question about whether it, whether it runs through OLC first before an agency makes that kind of determination, that's also a norm, right? There's no legal requirement that it does, right? So isn't that also get back to this question about uh, the strength of these kinds of norms and how the government is run on these kinds of issues? Yeah, I think I think that's fair. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't I, I think you're right, and Virginia, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there is any reg that requires an agency to get sign off from OLC before taking the position that a rule or statute they administer is not constitutional and they're just going to cease to enforce it. Uh, but yeah, there's a pretty strong norm about that, uh, and, and, and at least in part because I think the Department of Justice has pretty significant equities in that sort of determination. And so I don't think, you know, in a well-functioning executive branch, I don't think you want to have individual cabinet secretaries making determinations like that without coordinating with uh, the Department of Justice. And that's sort of the, that's what, at least a significant part of why OLC exists is to mediate any potential disputes on that front. I think that's right. And I also think agencies see a significant benefit in having OLC weigh in um, that makes them more likely to ask in this setting uh, for that, um, for that analysis from OLC. It, it's, I think, a valuable commodity if you're going to uh, take this kind of action and seen as such uh, throughout the executive. 
Okay, let's go. Uh, sorry, I was going to say, and part of the reason why is at least in some circumstances, what you know, non enforcement sometimes is judicially non reviewable, but in other times there will be review, and so you you can end up in a situation where if the agency doesn't clear, you know, coordinate with the Department of Justice and they get hit with a lawsuit, you can end up in a bad spot where the department thinks that the rule actually is valid. So that, that's just a very practical reason why it makes sense to coordinate. Right. Just one one thing I wanted to say in response to an earlier strain of this conversation was uh, more in the way of a question, but I feel like everybody t is tiptoeing around now the question of how, you know, how long is Chevron and other similar kinds of deference going to survive and that that concern kind of permeates any decision about appeals or how you litigate or how strongly you, um, or what arguments you might make when reversing position with respect to an agency rule. So that it's kind of a backdrop uneasiness that now is part of the discussion of cases involving review of administrative action. You know, it's interesting. Uh... In general, I don't know if I share that reaction. Uh, like, I, I don't. I don't think it's wrong to say that you know, at least at the Supreme Court, there's a, po a distinct possibility of real change in the scope of Chevron. Obviously, in lower courts, that's not in the cards. At least, if you know they adhere to what the Supreme Court said about following Supreme Court precedent. So, unless you're worried about teeing up a vehicle, uh, at least in direct appeals, I'm not sure it makes a lot of difference. I could think of a handful of cases, sort of outlier cases, where concerns about Chevron might have implicated either what arguments were made or whether to seek further review. But by and large, for like normal, just sort of run of the mill major agency actions where there's no real fight that Chevron under existing doctrine applies. I maybe on the margins I can see not pushing really aggressive interpretations, but that's largely because at this point you're likely to lose those under Chevron because I think there's a pretty decided trend towards applying step one with some real teeth, or whether you call it step one or step two, you know, saying that there's a very narrow zone of ambiguity and you're supposed to take ambiguity or the lack thereof pretty seriously before you jump to step two. In but, but when we're in the area that we are in, which involves lurching upon a transition to a new administration, you're sort of by definition in an area where you're talking about a high profile case of the sort that might involve thinking at least about the possibility of Supreme Court review. Um, and, you know, in that context, I, I do think it's, a, you know, myself, it's a little bit of an ant at the picnic right now, you know. Yeah, you might be right. It's interesting. So, so Hash mentioned a moment ago about why an agency might want to involve the Department of Justice because it would have to defend the agency in any subsequent litigation. And I think Farnaz mentioned earlier that in rulemaking you need to get you need to involve OIRA and other parts of OMB. And so, I wonder if anyone has further reflections on whether the fact that lots of different parts of the government with different sorts of equities have to weigh in on a lot of these decisions is uh, helpful in that it promotes or like it, it's a, a counterweight to a kind of lurching or maybe the fact that lots of entities are involved in these kinds of decisions might encourage more of that lurching. I don't know if people have thoughts about that phenomenon. I'm actually not sure that lurching should be the guidepost to think about the value oh. of weighing in. So if I could, although I really like the framework, I think it's an important one. I don't know that it's the only one that should be relevant there. And if we're thinking about the value of a deliberate executive branch, where you want to make thoughtful, careful, reasonable decisions that thoroughly assesses equities and competing balances, maybe from competing sets of regulated parties and different aspects of the regulated public, I think that in and of itself is a value that um, that mirrors some of the slowness that kind of bogs down Congress. And so certainly it's a slowness in the executive branch, but I think it's a slowness that helps to further this value of um, you know, deliberative, rational based decision making, in addition to the kinds of expertise I was talking about before, I think that's a separate uh, value of this. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, it's, uh, I'm not sure about what, uh, about the initial question from Judge Mnashi. Uh, just thinking about it in terms of my experience and just how it could work. I think the, uh, the existence of multiple parties could cut either way. On the one hand, often you cre it creates inertia. You have lots of different interests, 
sometimes they cut in different directions. And if you've got a lot of people cutting in different directions, sometimes that just leads to, okay, well, we're not going to flip positions when no matter what we do, different parts of the government are going to be upset about it. Uh, and other times, I think may, arguably that frees up the Department of Justice, right? It's, you know, the, act, the action agencies all disagree. No one agency has any greater stake than the other. And maybe it frees up the department to decide, well, we're just going to decide what we think is right and that's what we're going to do. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, it's not a particularly helpful answer, but I think the dynamics, it's hard to generalize. I, I, a lot of it will depend on the specifics. I'll say that I actually think it's a very good process, even though when I was going through it, I didn't quite appreciate it because it was so long. But I think that there are some unintended consequences that you can't anticipate because when you're one agency enforcing a particular statute, you don't, oh, you're not always aware of all the unintended consequences it might have, especially with other agencies that enforce either that same statute or a similar statute. So for example, I think that sometimes well, with respect to the Title IX rule, at least, there are certain intersections with other rules, like Title VII also concerns discrimination based on sex, but in the employment context. So I think it was invaluable to confer with agencies and the EEOC, as well as the Department of Labor, on some of the kind of consequences with respect to labor laws and the intersection of those laws. And I think it actually makes for a really good product because you also don't want it you don't want to have a situation where one agency is really using a different rubric for the same statute as other agencies. And so to the extent that there could be unity within the executive branch, I think that is something that we should aspire to. And even though the process is onerous, it's worth it. Okay, so I have another question uh, from the audience for Farnaz specifically about the Title IX regulation. And it says, um, given your experience in university's GC office, will colleges that do not continue to enforce the last administration's Title IX rule run a real risk of civil liability from students or faculty who are harmed by a non-compliant hearing? Well, I'd like to distinguish the types of liability. So there's liability before courts, like a federal, you know, federal litigation under Title IX. And I would state that for the most part, our rule you don't have to follow the Title IX regulations to a T to avoid liability for Title IX litigation because the Davis standard is deliberate indifference. And although we use that standard as part of our regulations, the, the way we define deliberate indifference might be somewhat different than the way that a court defines deliberate indifference. So it's not as though you have to follow our process to a T to avoid liability. But what I will say is you absolutely should adhere to the regulations because they are currently the rules that have the force and effect of law. And also, I think that there is liability still with the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights because that office should still enforce this rule. And there are some actions that people may take against the department, including litigation, if they don't enforce that rule or if they are if there's reasonable delay in enforcing that rule. I remember that at least one judge ruled against the Department of Education, and this is in the context of a different set of regulations on borrower defense or payment, but that the department's actual delay in processing borrower defense or payment applications, that that delay was actionable under the Administrative Procedure Act. But my personal opinion is that if you do follow the Title IX regulations, because they so closely follow the case law, that you will minimize your liability with respect to any lawsuit under Title IX. So is there a case law that states you have to provide a party with the other party's evidence within 10 days after you receive it? No, that's not in case law. But if you do that, does it make for a more fair process such that due process is satisfied so that both parties have notice and a meaningful opportunity to respond? Absolutely. So the way that we structured the regulations was such that if you follow them, you likely will, will avoid liability under Title IX or under actions pursuant to 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. Okay, maybe I could go back uh, to something um, Virginia said earlier in your opening remarks when you were talking about what would be the source of anti-lurching constraints and you were evaluating whether the take care clause uh, might impose such restraints. But it seems like this discussion has focused to a large extent on the Administrative Procedure Act. There was concern that certain litigation moves 
might evade requirements of the, allow an agency or an administration to evade requirements of the APA. And I think Farnaz was pointing out that using guidance documents or so on might evade requirements of the APA. So maybe we should understand the APA as setting up a kind of set of norms that constrain the executive branch, whether those kinds of norms are judicially enforceable or not is a separate question, which you might want to address. But should that be the focus of this uh, principle that you were talking about that maybe we should look for? So I do think it's, uh, it's a helpful constraint on executive agencies. Of course, it doesn't um, affect the president um, and his ability to move. So I know we haven't spent a lot of time talking about executive orders um, or the office of the president, but you know, that would be one place where it would be less helpful. I, I do think, you know, a, sub, a substitute or a, you know, a congressional enactment of the presumptions of regularity that now um, are in the Administrative Procedure Act does constrain uh, the executive branch to some significant effect. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a really good point that it's a statutory potential substitute that applies to part of the executive branch to regularize. It's the procedure and substance of changing its mind. Uh, it, it, uh, it's so well accepted that um, I think I, you know, may have undervalued it for that purpose in terms, but I was primarily focused on uh, what might constrain the president uh, in connection with his actions. And I think that is a much, it's a much harder question to try to find a source of law that might do that uh, outside the take care clause, you know, in any uh, statute or in the constitution. Um, I just, and, and Hosh's point that it's probably a political question, how, um, how far that take care clause can get you uh, as an anti-lurching principle is exactly right. So we don't know the substance of it. The executive branch has developed norms to try to uh, constrain it uh, to the extent that our government values it, which it's embodied in the constitution, I think, with respect to the other branches. But it's very hard to find anything other than those norms, uh, in my view, that's uh, a, an actual legal constraint. Um, and I am not sure that I even see in the take care clause itself um, a, a sort of direction about uh, not changing um, that isn't counter, uh, that doesn't have a counterweight in the other constitutional provisions that suggest that elections have consequences. So the other problem with the APA, in addition to the fact that it doesn't constrain the president, is that it doesn't constrain the Department of Justice's litigating positions. Like those are not final agency action that's reviewable, and they're also you they would be viewed as committed to agency discretion by law. So I agree that the APA is a pretty significant constraint on the ability of the underlying action agency to change their rules. They have to go through reasoned decision making. They have to go through notice and comment. They have to consider reliance interests. All you know, those are all true. Uh, but if it's just the government in a brief flipping positions, or more importantly in this context, not taking appeals or dismissing appeals, the APA is not going to constrain that. Can I go ahead? I was just going to connect that point to our previous conversation about the posture in which the administration would accept a lower court adverse judgment or, or you know, ask for a stay. Um, uh, do we think that though that the agent that the agent that, excuse me that the government's decision um, in that kind of litigating posture really implicates a rule of law concern? Or is it an, a norms based concern? So uh, relying on the district court um, injunction, for example, and raising these questions about the pr proper procedure under which the DOJ is going to dismiss or 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 seek to to not to not dismiss while the before the agency has actually you know issued an NPRM. What do people think about that? Are, when in in the critiques that are coming up in this conversation, is it really a rule of law concern or is it a doesn't something just feels a little squishy, but it's not totally constrained because I'm sort of sensing both directions. Yeah. So I look again. I don't think it's a rule of law concern in the sense that they are acting illegally if they acquiesce in an adverse district court judgment. But I think that there's a rule of law concern in the sense that agencies can't just suspend rules without going through notice and comment, even though that they plan to go through notice and comment. They're, you know, the Trump administration, the beginning of the administration, tried doing that in a bunch of circumstances and was largely unsuccessful. 
with court saying that the suspension of a rule counts as an agency action, and therefore I put the rulemaking. Uh, and so I think there's a pretty significant rule of law concern in getting the functional equivalent of a suspension of a rule by acquiescing in a district court judgment, not because you even necessarily think the district court judgment's wrong, just because it's like very convenient for you that this district court did something that's legally erroneous. And it seems to be particularly strong in cases like the public charge situation where you know, like the Supreme Court has already granted a stay. So the Supreme Court has already signaled that they are likely going to reverse the district court. And then to let that be the mechanism through which you wipe out a rule, that does strike me as creating rule of law concerns, though not actually being illegal. Right. So, so in that case, even though the DOJ would not be violating the APA, as you point out in flipping position, if the effect of a decision has the has the um, or if a decision has the effect that it excuses the agency from doing something under the APA it otherwise would be required to do, maybe that's a framework for evaluating uh, whether such an action is appropriate. Would does that make sense? Anybody? Yeah, I, I, th I think that's right. Um, and you know, again. I, I, a lot of it, I think, turns partly in you know what the district court held, right? So, it's not uncommon for even within the same administration, if a district court sets aside a rule on narrow procedural grounds or on a narrow, arbitrary and capricious ruling, the sort of thing that the agency can easily cure and that doesn't handcuff the agency's discretion going forward. Often, even within the same administration, the decision will be made. Look. It, it's going to take time to take the appeal. We may not win the appeal. We can fix this faster on the agency level. We'll just do that. I, I don't think anyone thinks that there's any, a rule of law concern with that. And I don't think there's any concern with an, a new administration making the same sort of judgment call if they're operating in good faith. I think it, where there's really, you know, the rubber really hits the road is when you've got a court striking it down as substantively invalid because that judgment takes the agency's policy discretion off the table. Like the agency can't do anything about that. And if, especially if it's a sort of a nationwide or uh, judgment or some sort of judgment that goes beyond the particular parties, which is a whole different issue. But it, it, when district judges issue those sort of rulings, it's gonna create real problems down the road. So for example, if one of these district judges says that the Title X rule or the public charge rule is substantively illegal, and you get a final judgment to that effect that's nationwide, it's not just that the Biden administration got to avoid having to go through notes and comment to repeal it. It's that, you know, four or eight years from now, or who knows how long, if another administration tries to come in and reinstate the uh, Trump rule, they're not gonna have to just deal with the legal argument, they're gonna have to deal with the argument that there's a final judgment, that like they're just precluded from doing that. And then there have to be litigation about whether you can escape the scope of a final judgment in those circumstances. Ash, does your uh, view turn on the Supreme Court stay decision? That is, if if in fact a new administration came in and made the judgment that the district court's ruling was correct, and therefore they weren't going to appeal, would you still see rule of law concerns in that scenario? Look, I, I think that the Supreme Court stay makes it a particularly concerning situ situation. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I think even when, for me, a, a large part of it turns on the substantive versus procedural, right? Whether the ground was it was substantively illegal. When, put it this way, it, during our administration, there were a lot of district court judgments that had been issued against Obama era rules. And what we tended to do not invariably, but all pretty commonly, was not acquiesce in district court judgments, even where we might have actually agreed with the district court, because we wanted to leave the playing field open for the agency. So what we would do is we'd keep take the appeal, keep it in the abeyance, have the agency go through notice and comment rulemaking, and then try to get the district court judgment vacated as moot and things like that to preserve broader executive branch discretion over time. Uh, and so... I'm not saying that that's a universal rule. It could be that the district court judgment is so clearly right that I, I don't think that it's there's really a rule of law concern in just acquiescing in it because that's all that's all that's ever going to happen, and you're not really constraining anyone. But it's when cases where there's a real argument to be made that the old rule is substantially lawful and that's now been taken off the table by district court judgment, and it's exacerbated when 
it's not just you know the executive branch internally predicting whether this is a valid rule or not. You've got the objective indicia of the Supreme Court granting a stay. So I have another question from the audience, which is, uh, as to regulations, does the ability of an executive to change positions benefit either those who generally favor a regime of strong federal regulation as opposed to those who would favor reducing federal regulation? Does either side enjoy an advantage? I, I'll just start by saying I don't think so, <laughs> that it depends on the, par the party in power and that depending, I mean, it's all context it's determinate, right? It all, it, it's so deeply depends on the background context and the and the rule itself. So I, I'm reluctant to say as a general matter that the ability to change positions favors one or the other side here. I, in general, I think I agree with that with one fairly marginal potential disagreement, which is generally when you have, when you're switching back to a rule that regulates people, third parties are gonna be able to sue over it. Sometimes when you're switching back to a rule that that doesn't regulate people, it might be harder to sue over it. So insofar as you've got an executive branch that's switching from a regulation to a non-regulation, that might, the ability to do that through executive maneuvering might, you might have greater latitude to do it, latitude to do it because you won't get sued over it compared to the administration that's switching from non-regulation to regulation. But I, th I think that's a fairly marginal uh, caveat to keep in mind because especially these days, it's not that hard to figure out someone who has standing even when you're switching to regulation. Yeah. So it does seem to be the case, you know, with some regularity lately that an agency will say, we are not going to regulate in this area because we believe the statute uh, does not give us power to. And when they decide not to regulate on that basis, instead of simply exercising their discretion based on circumstances that they find, it does seem to be susceptible to a legal challenge, that kind of decision that they lack power, um, as courts tell them they do have power. And, and you know, I, I find that a kind of an interesting choice by agencies to, to specifically state that they don't have power and uh, courts do seem to want to correct them. Uh, and say, look, you're 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 not legally barred from doing this. This is a policy choice that you're making. Yeah, so it's an interesting point. Uh, there are two parts of that, right? So I agree with you on the merits that if the court can reach the merits, they're more likely to reverse an agency that says we're not going to enforce because we don't have the power, then we're not going to enforce because we choose not to as a policy matter. But for either of those things, you still have to have someone who has standing to complain about the non-enforcement. Now, sometimes that will be easy, but sometimes actually it might be difficult, right? So for example, I'm just gonna think of something off the top of my head. If there were limitations on when you could forgive student debt and they just said, we're not gonna, and it's debt with, to the government. So let's, let's say it's a government debt and the executive branch stops enforcing some of the limits on that. It's gonna be pretty hard to find someone who has standing to complain about that. But I agree with you that on the merits, once you get there, courts are more willing to adjudicate a pure legal question of whether you have the authority. Whether to do it or not raises interesting strategic questions for an agency. On the one hand, saying that you had to do it sort of takes some of these reliance interests off the table, because if your hands are tied by the law, then like the reliance interests are sort of beside the point. But on the other hand, if you say that you had to do it, then if you're wrong about that as a legal matter, you've exposed yourself to getting set aside under the APA. For, for relying on an erroneous legal reason. Whereas if you just said, we're just choosing not to do it, uh, you might either be non-reviewable under cases like Heckler versus Cheney, or at a minimum, you're only subject to sort of arbitrary reasons for you. So there are costs and benefits to which, which way you go on things like that. And I just like to add from a normative perspective, I think the ability to change positions actually does favor people who are supportive of a larger regulatory regime because once the footprint of a federal agency has been expanded to include jurisdiction over something through regulations, it is almost impossible. I mean, it's it's possible, as Virginia pointed out, to take the position that the agency no longer has authority for that, but it's very rare. So I think some of the criticisms we received, for example, on the Title IX final rule is why are there regulations on this at all? 
and with respect to that the proceeding for allegations of sexual harassment shouldn't really be conducted by a school at all if it's truly a crime because that belongs with a police department but there's no going back and so i think that once a agency starts down a path and assumes that this a, a statute covers a particular topic and starts regulating on it normatively the next administration may change and may try not to increase that footprint but once that footprint is established it's really difficult to get rid of it okay so we are at the end of our time um let me ask quickly if anybody has some final comment they'd like to make before i uh thank everybody and close it out no well thank you very much so i want to note for the audience that the AirMeet platform on which people are in has an opportunity to, to meet with other attendees in the lounge. Uh, so please join us in the lounge to network with other participants or to ask questions of some of the panelists to so join the lounge. As the session concludes, you will see an alert on the top right corner of your screen. You, are, you should click on that alert to move to the lounge and then click on one of the boxes that appears uh, to join a table. You'll need to turn your camera and mic or phone back on when you sit down at a table. Uh, most of the speakers have agreed to join us in the lounge. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, an interesting discussion and remind everyone that the next conference event, a discussion of judicial nominations and confirmations will begin at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, but please stand by for now for the alert directing you to the lounge. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.